Good morning, everybody. I'm Judy Singer. I'm the Senior Vice Provost for Faculty Development and Diversity, and I want to welcome everybody here uh, to a university conversation about mentoring. Uh, we see this as a unique opportunity to bring together several different types of groups of people who don't normally uh, cross paths. So one particular feature of this event is that it's across the university. We have people from uh, the Longwood area who are both medical school and the School of Public Health who are here, and we have people from all across the Cambridge campus joining us. This conversation was also designed to be a uh, cross cohort. So we have both distinguished senior mentors and senior faculty who want to learn more about mentoring and what they can do, as well as some tenure your track faculty who are hopefully willing to share with us uh, their perspectives on what would be helpful. One of the things you learn when you start to think about mentoring is uh, the people who want to be helpful don't actually know what it is that they can be doing to be helpful, and we're hoping that this conversation uh, will stimulate uh, ideas. I want to say a few words about why we're focusing on mentoring. This is actually the first of three uh, faculty development events we're holding over the next few weeks. The other two are focusing on book publishing and uh, media training, learning how to talk to reporters and people in the media. Uh, we're starting out with mentoring because we are using that to focus on the renewed commitment of the university uh, to a tenure track system. And uh, that's something that's a sea change from old Harvard. I was at a conference last week down in Washington and I saw a uh, faculty member who's now at the University of Michigan who used to be a faculty member at one of our professional schools who we tried to keep but who left. And I asked how things were going and whether we could possibly lure him back. And he said, well, but where I am is much better. It was much better for, for junior faculty. And I said, well, no, Harvard has a tenure track system now. And he said, what happened to the eight-year postdocs you used to give people? Um, we actually see this as a commitment to the development of people that we hire that we hope to be promoting up through the ranks. And we need mentoring programs because if we actually commit to this kind of system, we need to make sure that our tenure track faculty can succeed as they move up the ladder. Uh, in my own career, uh, mentoring has been uh, keenly important. In fact, as I walk into the faculty club, uh, I, I am always reminded of my first encounters here, which were breakfast with my graduate school uh, thesis advisor, Fred Mosteller. And we would meet for breakfast in the uh, main dining room at the ungodly hour of 7 o'clock, which to me was like, you know, I I couldn't believe it. Um, but Fred would very kindly uh, take me aside and sort of talk to me about my, my own professional development when I was hired. As a, I actually knew I didn't want to be a professor uh, because of the way I saw junior faculty in the Harvard Statistics Department be treated. Um, in fact, the department has just tenured last year its first person from within in about 45 years, uh, just, to, just to recognize the kind of sea change. But I saw junior faculty, and they were treated like, uh, you know, rotating, uh, you know, day laborers, and it just didn't make a very attractive career. The reason I ended up going into academia was because of mentors, for people who took me aside and said, Judy, you'd be really good at this. You don't really understand as a graduate student what life as a faculty member is like, and so why don't you apply, for, in fact, for the only job I ever applied was an assistant professor at the Graduate School of Education, where, I, uh, where my faculty position is now. And there, too, I was fortunate enough to have mentors who really uh, helped me and helped me understand. That was at a time when there were very few women at the university. Pat Graham was the first woman, was my dean. She was the first woman dean at the university, appointed in 1981 by President Bach. She was the 13th female tenured faculty member at the university. I mean, people used to know their number, just to put it in perspective. And when she joined the faculty and came to the faculty club, she had to go in through the back door, because that's where women went. Um, I tell those anecdotes just to say that this is a new Harvard, or as Martha Minow said in a recent interview in the New York Times about uh, Harvard five years after Larry Summers' infamous comments on women in science, this is not your father's Harvard. And what I hope today is we can actually have a conversation about how Harvard can support all faculty in their professional development. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Lisa Cariaga Lowe, Assistant Provost for Faculty Development and Diversity, who will do some housekeeping matters and also int introduce our distinguished panel. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good 
Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming this morning. We are so delighted with the response that we got um, when we sent out the mentoring invitation. In fact, uh, the response was so large that we were unfortunately unable to meet uh, everybody's needs, and so we actually had to turn away some people. But we hope to um, have additional conversations around mentoring at the various schools very soon. Um, just a few housekeeping notes. So you all received a packet. Um, the the green packets are actually uh, sciences packets, so the articles are slightly different. Um, the uh, purple is uh, a humanities and social sciences packet, and the only real difference is uh, really the research articles that we've included in there to help you uh, think about mentoring from the perspective of your disciplines and fields. In addition, uh, in the packet, we provided uh, some tools that we hope will help you uh, think about mentoring, not just for uh, faculty in your department, but also thinking about uh, mentoring in uh, different perspectives and through various um, opportunities that you might find yourself in, whether it's working with young faculty or uh, working with trainees or uh, working with students. So I hope that you find that useful. In addition, as you think about mentoring in your departments, um, we do hope that you will allow us to um, assist you as needed. Um, if you are thinking about developing mentoring programs, uh, in particular for your tenure track faculty, we have some wonderful experts in the room, and I hope that you will uh, use them today, but also beyond that, to be in touch with them um, as you begin to think about developing mentoring programs um, for your faculty. Today, we are very honored, actually, to have in our midst um, leadership from the schools, uh, four individuals who actually have been instrumental to developing mentoring activities um, at the various schools. And I am um, honored to have them come with us today, some of them um, just um, you know, flying in early this morning from Chicago, Joan Reed, and others who are uh, also, you know, just running in and out of meetings. So we are grateful to them for taking the time to come here. Our four panelists this morning who will speak from uh, the perspective of leaderships in the schools around mentoring are Cherry Murray, Dean of Harvard University School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, and the John A. and Elizabeth Armstrong Professor of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Who you Frank, Dean of the Faculty and uh, TNG Angelopoulos Professor of Public Health and International Development at the Harvard School of Public Health. Joan Reed, Dean for Diversity and Community Partnership and Associate Professor at the Harvard Medical School as well as Associate Professor of Society, Human Development and Health at the Harvard School of Public Health. And Michelle Lamont. Robert I. Goldman, Professor of European Studies and Professor of Sociology and African and African American Studies, as well as the Senior Advisor on Faculty Development and Diversity in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Thank you all for coming today and uh, look forward to hearing your thoughts on mentoring. So we will start with Dean Murray and then Dean Frank and Dean Reed and then Professor Lamont. Sure. <coughs> so I'm glad to see so many people here interested in mentoring. So I was uh, asked by Judy to talk a little bit about my own personal experience and then what I've done at the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, which we call C's. Um, so first off, I've been here at Harvard for exactly six months. <laughs> so I don't know Harvard that much, but I'm learning a lot about it. And I have been having uh, lunches with the tenure track faculty at the School of Engineering. We're a growing school, and so we actually are hiring uh, quite a few. By that, I mean we have only 70 FTE faculty, and uh, we're hiring, uh, in proportion to that, quite a few uh, people. And so, um, they and uh, engineering is moderately uh, new at Harvard. That is to say, it's been around for hundreds of years, but it's a brand new school since 2007. And so um, 
it is, uh, it, it's the first, let's see, it's the last school and the first in 70 years that is a new school at Harvard. And so we're kind of getting ourselves together as, you know, what is this school going to be? So let me first talk a little bit about my personal experience with mentoring. So I uh, went to MIT, got a PhD in physics, and was recruited by Bell Laboratories and went to Bell Laboratories um, just immediately after uh, graduate school. And uh, my first week at Bell Laboratories, I had an anti-mentoring experience. <laughs> Someone from the department came in and said, so you're here, what are you going to do? And so I said, here's the kind of stuff I you know, was planning on doing. I'm going to set up these experiments. This is what I told people. And the, the reaction of this person was, well, you're never going to survive here. So that was my uh, anti-mentoring experience, which I did not consider to be very um, positive. Um, and when I became, uh, let's see, I got on the leadership council, which is very much like the faculty council here. I set up, uh, I actually went around to all of the new members of technical staff in the research area and asked them, would you like a mentor? And 100% of them, whether they were male, female, underrepresented, didn't matter, said yes. And so I set up a mentoring program at Bell Labs, and which actually worked uh, quite well. Then as I got up higher in um, management there, uh, I was assigned a formal mentor who was the head of a business unit, uh, which I found to be extremely useful. Uh, when I was a department head, which is like the third level of management. Uh, and my, you know, so not, uh, Bell Labs did not do very well uh, until we actually put in a mentoring program for the young people, but by the time you got into management, they did extremely well. Um, so when I arrived at Harvard, I discovered that we did not have a mentoring program. That is to say we had an informal mentoring program where the um, former dean had said, why don't you go mentor this person too? But the person didn't know they were being mentored and it was quite. <laughs> so what I set up is a mentoring networks, uh, which is, the, we don't have departments in the school, so I had to assign an associate dean to each tenure track faculty member so nobody fell between the cracks. And then they are in charge of a mentoring uh, developmental uh, committee. And the committee, so we all sat together as associate deans and suggested names of people for each of the tenure track faculty. Um, and then uh, asked the tenure track, the associate dean sits with the tenure track uh, faculty member and asks what do you, um, which of these people would you like? Or do you do you thinking of someone else as your formal mentors? Um, so three or four people are on this mentoring committee, and I have a meeting every quarter with the associate deans, who are the chairs of these mentoring committees, to see how people are doing. So Michelle asked me uh, today, "How is this going?" And actually, it's going very well, except um, some of the uh, tenure track faculty were on leave, either maternity leave or some other leave. And they kind of fell um, between the cracks. That is to say, all of the associate deans at the very beginning went out when I asked them to, but the ones um, to talk to their uh, tenure track faculty, but the ones <coughs> who weren't there at the time, kind of, they kind of forgot about it. So. I reminded the associate deans again, and now I'm having lunches with the tenure track faculty and asking them how it's going. And I think it's going a whole lot better. So I guess the, the, um, the storyline about this is keep following up if you're setting up a mentoring program. Keep following up with both the mentors and the mentees to make sure it's working. So thanks.
Um, good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Julio Frank. I have been uh, Dean of the Harvard School of Public Health for twice the amount uh, <laughs> that Cherry, <laughs> so uh, for about a year. So you have the uh, table here of um, new deans, at least on, on this side of the table. Um, but thank you very much for inviting me because uh, mentoring is really a, a topic that's very, very near and dear to my heart, probably stemming from uh, the opposite. I mean, a, 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 a very, very fundamental mentoring relationship I developed first as a graduate student and then as a junior faculty member uh, <coughs> with um, uh, Abedis Donavidian, who was actually a graduate of the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, and, and I went to the University of Michigan to study with him and under him and then uh, joined the faculty um, uh, with him. And, and I think this was uh, probably not just one of the most informative, but one of the most formative experiences of my life. So I, I think through having benefited from, from what a good mentoring relationship is, I'm a, I'm a strong believer in, 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 in that. Because, um, uh, you know, the, the academia is a highly competitive environment, and it is not obvious, even uh, after having been there in the student role, how to navigate those waters without um, uh, this sort of very, very personal uh, guidance. Um, fortunately, the Harvard School of Public Health has had a long tradition of uh, emphasizing mentoring, um, particularly my predecessor, Barry Bloom, uh, already in the year 2000, formed a committee uh, to assess uh, junior faculty mentoring. And based on the recommendations of that faculty commi uh, committee, uh, each department was then required to develop its own mentoring policy, uh, which included assigning each new faculty member a mentor at the time of, of the faculty member's appointment. Um, so the school, um, I I in addition, although it looks like um, a play on words, uh, you have to monitor mentoring. Uh, monitoring mentoring is a key uh, aspect. So um, there's at the school a biannual mentoring survey and, and, um, and through that, you know, we've learned that a lot of progress has been made, but also there's a lot of, um, uh, much more than needs to be done. So <coughs> since I began my tenure, because I had the privilege of uh, spending the full term of 2008 already being appointed, but not yet having taken uh, office, uh, I spent those four months coming every month for a week uh, to Harvard. And, and mentoring was one of the topics that emerged right at the top of my conversations, early conversations with department chairs and with faculty members. So I've uh, made this one of my priorities. Uh, particularly because, you know, the way I've expressed not so much the vision but the ambition for the School of Public Health is to make it the first school of public health of the 21st century, the first both in time and in quality. And you can only build the school of, of the 21st century with the generation of the 21st century. And that generation is, is the generation of the junior faculty members. So, so the only way to do, uh, to be effective uh, in, in realizing that ambition is to actually invest in, in junior faculty. So uh, among other things, uh, we've established uh, for the first time an office of an associate dean for, for research that uh, funds seed grants, um, provides scientific editorial support, external review of grant proposals, a number of uh, support mechanisms for a school that's heavily dependent on uh, research and where promotion is heavily uh, uh, dependent on uh, research productivity. Uh, <coughs> we've also, um, pr probably my diagnosis is that a, a lot of progress has been made, but the remaining challenge is heterogeneity across departments. So, you know, the quality of your mentoring relationship should not have such variation because then al also in the uh, networks of uh, your faculty, the uh, realization of very different experiences is a, fac a factor in demoralizing some, some people that, are, that, that you know, don't get the quality that they see peers getting. So trying to um, achieve some uniform standards, high standards, uh, is one of my priorities. So some school-wide mentoring guidelines have been uh, established. And under these new guidelines, um, or these guidelines, each new junior faculty member meets with the chair of the department soon after arriving at the school. At that time, a primary mentor is identified. Sometimes there's also a secondary mentor. Uh, the mentors meet with the mentees at the beginning of their appointment. And then at a minimum, they have to meet at the end of each academic year 
to to review academic progress and plan for the for the next year. So uh, you know there's a formal structure, but I think uh, uh, it's also very important to stimulate informal mentoring relationships. Um, so in a sense, you know, it's a um, uh, it's a multi-tiered strategy with primary, secondary, and informal mentors. And in addition, members of the um, leadership of the academic administration at the school, particularly the senior associate dean for, for faculty affairs and the associate dean for research that I just mentioned, uh, meet with, with the, with the uh, junior faculty at critical points in, in, their, in, 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 in their careers. So it's these three layers of the chair, the formal and informal mentors, and then the uh, school-wide um, uh, uh, academic leadership. But let me end, because they did ask us to talk a little bit about personal experience, and I thought what I would do, and this will take literally a minute, uh, when my uh, beloved mentor, Avedis Onavidian, uh, passed away after a very, very productive and rich life, I was, having been his uh, student and pupil, uh, to speak at his memorial, and I reflected on the, on the relationship. Uh, so let me quote two paragraphs from, uh, or two, uh, just a very brief, mentioned to what I said there, um, and, and this is what I said. Ours, ours referring to Avedis and me, was the paradigmatic mentoring uh, relationship. In our age of mass education, the mentor has become an endangered academic, academic species. A mentor teaches you, but it's much more than a teacher. A mentor befriends you, but it's much more than a friend. A mentor guides you, but it's much more than a guide. What a true mentor does is one of the greatest gifts of generosity. He, or I was talking about Avidis, but we would say he or she, sows in your mind and in your soul the seeds that will nourish intellect and spirit for the rest of your life. So, I mean, to me, this is the, the, the nature uh, uh, of the mentoring relationship. And let's not forget where this word comes from. It's actually an individual, a figure in Greek mythology, mentor, who's entrusted with the care of Telemachus uh, when, when his father has to go to the Trojan Wars. So although in this marvelous plasticity of the English language, we've turned it into a verb and an <laughs> adjective, uh, let us not forget that the root of the word refers to an individual. And it's this personal dimension, this very, very profound, deep relationship <coughs> that I think is uh, holds both the enormous potential and also the great rewards of mentoring. Thank you. <laughs> so good morning. Like others, I've been asked to give both a personal perspective, but also part of a perspective from Harvard Medical School. And so I'll say personally, in terms of mentoring, uh, as you look through uh, the literature and you hear people talk about it, they uh, talk about issues such as matching on gender and matching on race, ethnicity, and how important those things are. And what I would say is that if I look at my career and my progression, if I were to find the perfect mentor that was matched on all of my dimensions, the only person that could mentor me is me. <laughs> um, and so for me, I have had multiple mentors. The idea of a network of mentors is the only way I have survived, and they have crossed race, ethnicity, and gender, and discipline. Um, they have been individuals, and as you talk about the anti-mentoring, that uh, have protected me from what Bill Silent calls the dementors and the tormentors. <laughs> and so, um, and they continue as I move forward in my career, uh, critical elements for my success and my balance. And those are the individuals who early on when I was at Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Public Health and my interests were very different from others, uh, told me to pursue my interests and backed me in pursuing my interests and creating my own space for what I thought was important and actually showed me that there was a value to advancing academically. Before then, I had not thought there was any value to it. And it was my mentors who told me that there was and were able to show me the way. I want to give you a, an example of some of the things that we've actually done at the medical school. And the first begins with uh, everyone saying that mentoring is critically important, but not really recognizing it, and our faculty feeling it wasn't really recognized. So in 1995, our office established a mentoring award for the school uh, that has grown over time. It is an award that was established in 1995, but has grown, and since then, over 3,700 
nominations have come in for close to 1,200 individual faculty members. It's grown from an initial award uh, that was named the Cliff Barger Award to having three categories, a Cliff Barger Award for those who have been uh, at, uh, in service for a minimum number of years, a, a Phylon Award for those who have been in service for more than 20 years, and what we call a Young Mentor Award for those who have been in service for less than 10 years. To date, there have been more than, uh, there have been 122 awardees. What I find important about this is when we did our new promotion criteria for the school, these awards were recognized within the promotions. And so how do you start to recognize mentoring and recognize it in a way that it starts to show up on individual CVs? It's taken into consideration for promotion, uh, recognized throughout our environment. Uh, other ways in which it has been recognized uh, include um, CHAD, which is a consortium or committee across the faculty development and diversity offices at the various Harvard-affiliated institutions with the medical school, and they actually offer a mentoring course, much uh, led by Jean Emmons, who is here, who is a silent mentoring awardee. Um, there is also a task force on faculty development and diversity that will be coming out with a report in the next few months, and one of the three main committees of this task force deals with mentoring, again chaired by uh, Jean Emmons. Um, when we look at mentoring, um, because I want to mention some of the other people that are here, and oftentimes you get an image of a, a sage white man with white hair and blue eyes and all the other kind of things that go along with that. And an important part of this is recognizing that mentoring occurs across all our faculty. And one of the people that we have here that I, I really want to point out is Jessica Henderson Daniel, who is the first woman and the first person of color to win the mentoring award at Harvard Medical School and recognizing it across the board. And Jessica, you should go like this. <laughs> um, so there are, are many ways, I think, in which we are trying to advance mentoring. The last part is actually taking from those individuals who have won the mentoring award, and now there is a council of mentors that is actually meeting and looking at what is going on within mentoring in the school, ways in which we can improve mentoring, but it's taking from the best across our campus and across disciplines. Thank you. Well, I have been, uh, I was appointed a year ago to uh, this new uh, role as uh, FAS uh, faculty advisor on uh, faculty development and diversity. And one of the reasons I agreed to do this is because I thought there was a really nice theme in place with many people uh, committed to creating uh, uh, cultural change in FAS. And this is not a minor thing. FAS is a very large part of the university. It's 40% of the faculty, 42 departments. And these departments are very different in their culture. Some of them have never promoted. Some of them have been promoting regularly over the last few years. So it's really a complex mosaic. So um, <clears throat> first, my experience my, with my own mentoring. I'm Canadian. I went to Paris as a graduate student at a very young age, and there was no mentoring. It was a pure, uh, you know, swim or sink system, and that was very difficult. It taught me resilience. And uh, in 1983, I went to Stanford as a postdoc, and I discovered a word that was totally unknown to me. I felt those students were unbelievably lucky, privileged, and also they were getting extremely good training. Then in 87, I was hired at Princeton in sociology, where I was for 15 years before coming here in 2003. And Princeton at the time still had a system where only one person in six approximately got tenure, and that was also a little bit baptism by fire. I really felt that they were not taking very good care of us, and many, many of my friends left when we got tenure. All our friends were gone, basically. And then I came here in, tw in 2003. My scholarship is on culture and inequality. I'm presently working on anti-racism uh, in France and the U.S., so I really have a long term commitment to trying to understand how uh, collective definitions of work influence reproduction of inequality. So my involvement in this is very much driven by my own scholarship. I also happen to have a significant other who also studies diversity. And actually on the Globe this weekend, there was a big uh, article on his work, which basically shows that 
uh, he studied 800 corporations looking at which one have been most successful at uh, favoring diversity. And he finds that what is most effective is structural change, that is appointing people who actually have as a responsibility or appointing task force who are in charge of overseeing diversification, and also using carrots and stick to really create change. And mentoring is a very bar big part of this, um, of the equation. So with all this background, when I, uh, my predecessor, Lisa Martin, had resigned in 2005, after um, having created a mentoring program where women were matched, only junior tenure track faculty were matched with uh, mentors in other departments, which was a very good idea because you can actually ask advice to people who will not be involved in your um, promotion that, you know, where you can look more vulnerable than the people who will be one day charged with looking at your work. Uh, departments were asked in FAS to report on uh, their mentoring activities, but there was just an enormous amount of informal mentoring occurring, and the literature shows us that informal uh, mentoring mostly benefits people who are entitled, and many, many people did not benefit from it. Um, so we also, so the idea was really to create a new system that was launched this fall where we're asking both departments and individuals to create mentoring plans. And actually, we don't use the word mentoring. We use the word development network, drawing on the work of David Thomas, who is an expert on the question, who works in the business school, and Manehika Higgins, who works in the uh, School of Education. And the idea is that uh, tenure track faculty uh, create a network of people who will, with multiple nodes, that will answer various needs. And the needs are evolving as they move through the tenure track system. And the word mentoring itself is not that great a word because, in fact, what most people are seeking is intellectual exchange. That is the ability to get people to read their work. When we work in my department to launch our mentoring plan this fall, talking with, this is what they want. They know that the faculty are unbelievably busy, but they want us to, you know, really understand that we're supposed to set aside a few days a year to read manuscript and give them feedback so that they will be able to get, uh, you know, improve the work that on which they will be uh, judged when they come up for tenure. So uh, departments had until March 1st to turn in their mentoring plans. And many of them have, I'm very pleased. The cultural change is very, uh, the, the purpose in fact is not to create these mentoring plans. It's truly to create a cultural change and creating a structure in itself is probably the easiest part of the challenge. What will be uh, much more of a challenge will be to monitor in a year what has been happening. And there I'm certainly gonna email my co-panelists to learn more about their uh, the tools that they have uh, put in place. I think that at Harvard, where there's such a strong culture of excellence, diversity is often viewed as a pollutant, or even claiming aid, help, is viewed as a pollutant, because we're all supposed to be so talented that the cream will rise naturally. Well, in fact, everyone who gets tenure gets a lot of help. They get their colleagues to read their work, they present their work at colloquium, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea is that to acknowledge that getting help is crucial to the raising of the cream, but we want more of a, an even playing field where more people get the help that they need to, uh, to become all they can be. And Harvard is, I think, a little bit, you know, if we think of what's happening at Stanford or at Yale, our peer institutions are fully engaged in this. You know, Stanford has its motto, diversity and excellence together. And we are very much, you know, moving in the same direction, Drew Faust, uh, uh, made a very important statement last week uh, to this effect. So um, I think that uh, a lot of people are pushing in the direction, same direction, and I'm personally quite optimistic for the future. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. We'll have to, um, we are in fact, um, just uh, as an FYI, we are in fact videotaping uh, this section of uh, this event, and so uh, we hope to uh, be able to have your faces on our website soon, uh, so that others who are not able to attend uh, can um, be guided by your wisdom, so thank you. We are privileged um, on many fronts here at Harvard, uh, but I think that our human capital at Harvard is unsurpassed, and 
we do indeed stand on the shoulders of many giants here, and often we don't recognize um, how they profoundly change our, our lives and how they profoundly change our academic community. So today we wanted to be able to acknowledge some of these individuals, and I hope that we can do more of this, as Joan had mentioned. We can do more to recognize the mentors and those who support us, uh, those who help us uh, through the difficult challenges um, ahead as we uh, try to develop careers here at Harvard. So I would like to have Professor Scott Edwards, if you could, if, as I call your name, if you could please stand. Um, um, in the front, so that we may embarrass you further. <laughs> Professor Scott Edwards, Professor Jean Emmons, Professor David Golan, Professor Virginie Green, Professor Ichiro Kawachi, Professor Michelle Lamont, Professor Everett Mendelssohn, Professor Joan Reed, and Professor Marion Wesling Resnick. For many years, these individuals have um, toiled uh, at many levels to support mentoring, uh, not just in their schools, but in the university. Some of them have established awards to honor those colleagues who have done mentoring in their departments and their schools. Others have simply um, developed their own informal mentoring programs um, without virtue of resources um, and often uh, at the expense of their own uh, personal scholarship. So we are very grateful to them for the work that they do. and. I hope that uh, you will enjoy meeting them in your discussion groups because they will serve as guides as you think about the questions that we have posed for these discussion groups. So on behalf of the university, we thank you for your profound contributions to mentoring and hope that uh, we can gain uh, insights um, and uh, guidance from you in the years ahead as we think about mentoring in the academy. Let's give them a warm round of applause. Sorry we keep on having to cut off the conversation, but that the conversations want to continue, I take, is a very good sign. And in particular, the cross-school conversations and the cross-cohort conversations are, are very eye-opening, in some cases with some concrete ideas about things that we might be able to try in our own environments, and in some cases, some very challenging problems to address. Uh, f uh, I have the pleasure now of introducing our provost, Steve Hyman, uh, who is going to uh, share with you some university perspectives on mentoring. So uh, please join me in welcoming Steve. Thank you. Let me uh, start by thanking you, uh, Judy and uh, Lisa, and the, the staff of your office. Uh, uh, and the Bach Center for organizing this very, very important event. And uh, let me thank in absentia those deans who either have been here or will be here later because uh, uh, high-level commitment is necessary to this activity. Those of you, uh, whether you are tenure-track faculty or uh, people who have uh, uh, leapt over that hurdle at some time in the past, recognize the importance of mentoring and at the same time recognize that it's often thankless and that the rewards uh, have to be uh, internal because you know you've done the right thing. Uh, as a university, uh, we often don't find uh, uh, adequate ways uh, to thank people for their extraordinary efforts, uh, for their, their citizenship, for their, 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 their caring. Um, uh, at least I, I feel uh, at a time of famine and dearth, at least we have muffins for you and, uh, and unhealthy things like bacon to, to express our thanks, to express our thanks. Um, but, but in all seriousness, uh, this is, this is uh, such an important area for the university. Uh, and before I launch into my remarks, I, 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 I uh, want to particularly recognize some of you here who have won uh, mentoring awards. And I, Seen some of you already, uh, Everett Mendelssohn uh, from Arts and Sciences, uh, Gene Emmons from 
uh, HMS, Ichiro Kawachi from Public Health, uh, Marianne Wessling Resnick from Public Health, Scott Edwards, who I saw from Arts and Sciences, and Professor Virginie Green from FAS, who I also saw a few minutes ago. Um, you are, uh, and I hope I'm not missing uh, other names, but you are uh, really uh, exemplars. Um, I also, uh, uh, again, uh, want to uh, thank members of the sort of leadership team and tenured faculty who are here to talk about this. You know, it's, I, 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 although the, uh, the president uh, of the university is the person who actually confers tenure, I chair half of the uh, tenure cases, uh, except for the, 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 the medical school, where, I, where actually I'm the last signature on all of them. And very often, uh, uh, I mean, the good news is that at, the, at this last step of the ad hoc, the success rate is very, very high. But all too often, uh, we see people for whom uh, the case is closer than it should be, despite their brilliance and their effort. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes uh, people who really should have made it uh, don't make it. Uh, and in some sense, the, uh, you know, there are many reasons for this, but, but often uh, I, I, I've thought to myself after a difficult case that had there only been the right kind of mentoring, um, uh, this would have had uh, a, a different outcome. And uh, uh, often uh, uh, people are left to fend for themselves, or they have sort of glancing, intermittent mentorship. Uh, and also from the point of view of the mentors, uh, it's important to engage in groups like this and stay up to date and understand what uh, the different schools are looking for because, uh, for example, in many of the schools, uh, uh, arts and sciences in particular, teaching, which uh, at one time was uh, considered to be um, something that uh, you, you, know, you, you had to do, but it wasn't uh, worth all that much, is now a, a, an important part of, of tenure cases. Uh, we just saw new criteria from the School of Public Health that uh, made teaching important. So each, each school has a, a different culture and different weights. And uh, while tenure track faculty shouldn't um, enslave their uh, energies and their interests, uh, to uh, some, some plan for what it takes uh, uh, to achieve tenure. Um, uh, ob obviously, people have to follow their, uh, their, their, their loves and their, their intellectual leads. Still, it is so important that people uh, understand uh, the, the, the system and, uh, and, and uh, have the kind of uh, helpful engagement uh, at every stage uh, so that uh, we can achieve what we want, which is the success of all of our tenure track faculty. Um, so in, in that sense, um, uh, I'm really happy to see this room full. Uh, and the only thing I could wish for is to see uh, many, many more rooms uh, uh, full. And uh, because, because in the end, um, uh, we have committed ourselves as a university um, uh, increasingly to a tenure track system or in, in some of the professional schools, something like that without the name. Uh, and what that really means is that we want to be committed to uh, our tenure track faculty. We want to get them uh, through these set of processes. But this is not a matter of magic. This is a matter of, of, of effort and engagement where uh, where mentoring is, uh, is particularly, uh, particularly important. And I think many of us uh, think back uh, to uh, the importance of, uh, uh, of senior faculty and, and mentors in our, in our own careers. Uh, and, um, and it's something, though, that uh, just has not been adequately institutionalized. And so um, I commend everybody for being here. I wish you all a productive uh, and, and useful day. Uh, and I hope uh, especially those of you who are uh, in, who are already tenured, uh, I guess that it's no, I was told it's no longer PC to talk about senior and junior faculty. Uh, uh, but, but those of you who are senior faculty, I hope you'll be evangelists uh, for the importance of mentoring in your schools because frankly, as I said at the outset, 
This is not enough recognized or enough rewarded, uh, but it is absolutely critical if we are going to succeed uh, as a university in one of our most important goals, which is to uh, help our tenure track faculty make it over this bar and permanently join our community. So thank you very, very much. I was in a group that uh, included uh, <clears throat> senior faculty and tenure track faculty in the social sciences and the humanities, but across different schools in uh, the Kennedy School, FAS, and uh, the Harvard School of Public Health and the medical school. And we had a really interesting conversation, a troubling one too, because some of the tenure track faculty who were there, I would say three of them, described context where they were really caught between two chairs in the sense of having a, an appointment uh, in a school where the discipline is fairly marginalized, not marginalized, but not the dominant discipline, what path to follow when basically your chair is very busy and is not uh, immediately available to give you uh, feedback about whether you should publish in your own field or published for your school. Another case uh, where department has been promoted since 1950 and the person is uh, basically doesn't know if his FTE will be in one department or another. So really, another case where you know the the the, the production that is being uh, the output of the scholar is a very unconventional one by Harvard's criteria. So for me in my role, I'm thinking we really need a kind of ombuds person to whom people could you know go and raise a red flag early on to try to understand better the criteria by which they are going to be. Uh, evaluated. A uh, second issue that um, was raised is that of uh, variation in the faculty in how much weight they put on various criteria of, you know, publication, what kind of publication, books versus articles, service, and teaching. And Judy Singer who was there, mentioned experience, uh, an experiment they did in the uh, School of Ed where they asked all the faculty to uh, attribute 100 points to the, you know, the various dimensions they use while looking at the file, and they found it was a very uh, a teachable moment when the results were distributed and the faculty came to the realization of how much difference there was and how much weight they put on the various criteria, which really made me think about the importance of spending much more time among the tenure, the senior faculty, thinking very much more explicitly than we do about what do we do when we are evaluating. We have now in FAS a situation where some departments have never promoted, others have promoted regularly, and I think among the more senior faculty who've been here for 40 years and those who've come over the last 10 years, there are different expectations about what a Harvard faculty should be, and this really needs to be talked about much more explicitly. So. Um, so that's the second uh, central theme in our conversation. The third one was how to find the good mentors. And uh, some of members of our group mem mentioned the importance of gossip and of hanging out in hallways and uh, really how much good ideas come at the most unexpected time. Uh, Ishiro uh, Kirashi, who uh, was trained in uh, New Zealand, was. Uh, uh, regretting the good habit of drinking tea together three times a day for 15 minutes, so we conclude, I think we should just institute that here in, in all <laughs> schools. So that's basically what came up. From I don't know if any of our group member would like to uh, highlight any other point that I did not mention, but no. So we had a very uh, active uh, discussion um, uh, raising first the fact that there are very different uh, uh, rules and uh, ways of looking at, quote, ladder faculty so that we didn't necessarily share a common language from the medical school, the hospitals, FAS, the, the School of Public Health, and therefore as mentoring um, uh, goes forward at, the, at Harvard overall uh, to make sure that the language is more global and more really accepting of the entire um, group. Um, and so that um, just in terms of the common language, the issues of promotion uh, versus career satisfaction and really uh, accepting some heterogeneity uh, in the definition of what we want um, for mentoring. Um, it was uh, clear that there should be expectations Harvard-wide of a change of culture, that mentoring was important 
uh, across all career trajectories. Um, a lot of interest in uh, mentor and mentee training so that, uh, again, there was more uniformity both in our senior faculty of knowing um, how to really effectively mentor, but for our junior faculty to have more um, information on how to be uh, a great mentor and what to expect. Uh, and uh, this could be in the form of uh, part of the boot camp that's part of, uh, apparently, when the uh, new faculty come to FAS in some other areas, perhaps orientation at the hospitals, so that there is sort of a module that explains um, some of the ways that one can think about um, being a mentee. Um, the other uh, issue is to certainly leverage the infrastructure of already the hospitals, the uh, departments, et cetera, and just to make it part of the faculty discussions, part of sort of every um, area, whether it's the faculty meeting, um, perhaps you could do mentor training because the faculty are already there at the faculty meeting uh, and they're not likely to show up at other places sometimes. Um, and then we talked about some of the various uh, models, um, which could be um, junior faculty doing peer mentoring. Um, there could be a, a senior person there or not there, so it could serve a networking focus. And also to help the junior faculty develop skills, there was a sense that many of our junior faculty are told, well, don't mentor anyone because that will uh, ruin your own career. Uh, so we're giving sort of an early message uh, that's not really what we want to uh, develop in the long run. Um, and then Jessica brought up some issues around serial mentoring. Um, you may think of it from the adolescent point of view, which is where I think of it, which is uh, serial uh, monogamy. Um, um, but uh, certainly to think about the fact that one needs developmental networks that uh, Kathy Cram and David Thomas and Monica Hickens and others have really thought about uh, in terms of a more broad-based uh, um, issue uh, for our faculty. It was interesting that the word career mentors is used very differently. In some places it's the um, scholarly or research mentor. In other places it's somebody worrying about your career who's not your division chief. Um, so I think if we can develop some common terminology, at least when we have these meetings, we'll know what each one's talking about. Um, but it was a very good discussion and we'd still be there in the living room if you hadn't brought us back upstairs. So thank you. to be mentored in the most effective way to weave from back to front and take the least amount of time. We had a very good discussion. We had representatives from uh, FAS, from Harvard School of Public Health, and the medical school, and from the medical school from both the hospital and from the medical school itself. And I'm going to go over lots of discussion, lots of ideas thrown out, but going down across the questions in terms of what are some of the critical needs. Uh, some of the areas that were discussed were uh, uh, Increasing knowledge about multiple career paths, that there's not only one path, being able to help people with their transitions, um, helping and encouraging individuals to take risk and understanding that advancement requires risk. Uh, this idea that although we're focusing now on those who are in the, the latter and understanding that, that we need the mentoring across the spectrum and that many of the people at the early stages of the latter are transitioning to more senior positions and they need that same kind of advice and mentoring. Uh, so keeping uh, something in place across the spectrum. Uh, there needs to be a mechanism for acknowledging and dealing with anti-mentoring. Um, uh, and the other one was uh, the mentees and what's needed for them is this network of those both inside and outside. So much, much of our focus today has been on the mentoring within our institution but equally there's a need to create the networks and the supports outside of our institutions. In terms of some of the roles and responsibilities for mentors and mentees, with regard to the mentors, they talked about a cultural competence and a holistic approach, um, knowledge for the mentor themselves that you just don't need one mentor, but you need multiple mentors, and this issue of it being quality and not quantity in terms of the mentor. And then for the mentees, this idea of paying it forward and at all levels that someone could mentor someone else who's coming behind them. In terms of some of the policies and practices, uh, we talked about something called mentor domains. Somebody mentioned mentor domains. And they talked about four domains, practice or what I'd call part of the scholarship or discipline. Second being promotion and understanding the system there. The third, academic productivity. And the fourth, environmental uh, and things such as work-life balance. 
the uh, other uh, component uh, dealt with uh, more of the institutional aspects and what institutions or departments could do. We talked about ways in which departments or institutions could support the mentoring by offering other programs. Uh, what was mentioned from the psych psychiatry department at Mass General were these writing seminars and what they call uh, charisma conferences. Uh, we also talked about faculty development sessions. Um, it was mentioned that there was a need uh, for mechanisms to make matches for individuals to be more aware of who's in the environment and who they who may be able to help them. And Harvard School of Public Health talked about they're uh, going to put in a mentor registry. Uh, we talked about the need for rewards or rewards uh, for mentoring, having mentoring resources available, something that might be online, the training and teaching of mentors. And then they talked about, and it alluded to an ombuds, somebody earlier alluded to an ombuds, but it was stated that that in and of itself would not be adequate. Anybody from our group that has other things that I might have left out? Thank you. <laughs>